Hello. I'd like to begin by setting out my credentials, if you like, by showing you the piece of my work which has been seen by more people than any other. This photo was taken by one of our students and linked to from Reddit. It's now been seen by almost two million people. This is one of our 50th anniversary plaques which we're putting up around the university this year. It commemorates something which happened here in the early 1970s when, strictly speaking, uh, a student didn't park his car in the fountain, he had it parked for him. Uh, this is another view of the same incident, which we published in our 2013 alumni magazine. Thank you, Jed Parker, for sending me that picture. But this isn't the proudest moment of my career. That would be another section of the same magazine which looked at the debate in the 1990s about gay people in the military. One of our former students, Nick Elwood, contributed to that debate by writing a memoir about his time as an openly gay man in the military before that debate even began. He gave it the rather fabulous title, All the Queen's Men, and gave an interview to The Guardian in which he talked about his time at Essex and said, it was common knowledge in the campus gay society that if you wanted sex, you went to the toilets near the barracks in Colchester. What I'm trying to tell you is, I work in communications. And the proudest moment of my career thus far is the time I got away with putting cottaging in the alumni magazine of a respected university. But I'm here today because I have two jobs, or I did when I started. I spent half the week doing this stuff and the other half the week working for these people, which on the face of it, might sound like a more boring job. But let's define our terms. Because if there's anything I'm involved in which could change the world, it's this. What I want to show you is that data can tell us stories too, which can be just as compelling as what we normally think of as human interest. And because I have these two jobs, I can tell you about these two different kinds of storytelling. So here's an example. Imagine you're a teenager growing up in a seaside town not far from here. This is Jaywick in Essex. It has quite a lot of boarded up shops like this, a fair few derelict buildings and not very many jobs. About 60% of people claim benefits here compared to a national average of about 15%. So you can see that if you are a teenager growing up here, the opportunities you have in life are not what they are in other parts of the country. Now, most of us think of deprivation as something which essentially happens north of here. It's in the old industrial areas, in remote rural places, and the southeast is relatively prosperous. But data can pinpoint exactly where it's happening. And in 2010, Oxford University's Index of Multiple Deprivation found that the most deprived part of England was this seaside town in Essex. This is a map The Guardian produced to illustrate the story, and you can see some of the deprived areas clustered where you might expect them to be. But once people know there's a pocket of deprivation somewhere else, local government and other organizations can target funding. There's a charity in Jaywick called Inclusion Ventures, which runs a drop-in center for children and teenagers there. They keep them active, they encourage them to eat healthily, they they give them something to do, and they give them emotional support. Sarah Hannes, who runs the centre, says that antisocial behaviour in Jaywick has dropped significantly since it opened, because they've got distractions. But a few years ago, it looked as though the centre was going to close for lack of funds. Because they could demonstrate a need, they were able to get a grant from the National Lottery, which has kept them open until today. They've recently heard they're getting another grant which will keep them open for another four years. Which is a big deal because it's the continuity of care they can offer that helps them to build up trust with those children. So although people who live in Jaywick don't like being stigmatized as coming from a deprived area, that label helps Inclusion Ventures get funding. And not just for the day-to-day -day running, they can apply for other bits of money here and there, sometimes to train one or two of the older teenagers as youth workers. 
which boosts their job prospects. They got a bit of money a couple of years ago to make a short film, which got the children being creative and learning new skills. The most significant thing they do, really, though, is give those children a sense that someone's listening, that somebody knows and cares that they exist. So data changes their lives. There's another index due this summer, and again, it'll be using health records, employment and tax data, and information about benefits. And one of the things it will show us is whether the investment there's been in JWIC in the last few years has been enough to change things. So, why this term, big data, which you've probably heard? Well, if you look at the exit poll at the UK's 2015 general election, and the opinion polls in the run-up to that election, you can see that talking to 22,000 people gives you a better idea of what's happening than talking to 1,000. There were other factors involved, but as a rule, the more information you have, the more accurate the story you're telling. And administrative data allows researchers to look at hundreds of thousands, even millions of people at once. It's administrative data because it's the information government departments and other organisations collect to do admin whenever you fill in a form, when you claim a benefit, pay your TV licence fee, take an exam, go to hospital. That information builds up and gives us a picture of how society works. And that can inform government policy. It can help to evaluate existing policies so we can see whether they're doing what they're designed to do. And it can help politicians and civil servants devise new policies. We can't guarantee that politicians will listen, but we can give them a serious weight of evidence which it's difficult to ignore. For example, in 2011, the Ministry of Justice and the Department of Work and Pensions brought together 40 million pieces of data, about 3.6 million people, to look at the links between leaving prison, claiming benefits, and finding work. Most of us know or can guess that it's difficult to find a job if you have a criminal record. But the research gave us real numbers. So we know now that over a quarter of all out-of-work benefits are claimed by ex-offenders. The Ministry of Justice is looking at the figures in more detail now to see if its policies are working and helping those people back into jobs. Because, of course, if they find work, that changes their lives. Apart from anything else, it makes them a whole lot less likely to commit another crime, which has benefits for anybody who might have been a victim of that crime. That's why this is our motto. It might sound like a big promise, but we think it's true. Looking at millions of people's data does raise the question of privacy. And we're talking about linking data from different government departments because if you look at health and social security and justice data together, for example, that gives you a better picture of what's going on. But people worry about their privacy, and quite rightly, especially if you use the word government anywhere near a discussion about it. But we're not talking about GCHQ reading your emails. We're talking about academic research. And although the data will allow researchers to focus in on specific neighbourhoods, and make comparisons. They're not really interested in, to take an example entirely at random, a greying, bespectacled 45-year-old guardian, guardian reader, tea drinker, and embarrassing parent. They want the big picture. And before they can see any of the data, all the information that could directly identify you or me is taken out. So my name, address, exact date of birth, national insurance number, national health service number, tax reference number, for example, all come out. There's a video about how we do this on our website. And there's information there as well about the rules researchers have to follow to keep the data safe. And about the secure environment they have to work in, which they can't take a mobile phone, a memory stick, or even a pen and paper into. And the potential benefits are huge. Imagine you have diabetes. One of the things diabetes can do is cause nerve damage, which can mean you can't feel if you have a foot ulcer. 
If you don't know it's there and it doesn't get treated, it can get infected and you can end up losing part of your leg. Diabetes can also damage the blood vessels and the retina at the back of your eye and cause blindness. But if you live in Scotland, your chances of having to undergo an amputation or a laser eye operation are falling, even though the incidence of diabetes is rising. This is a graph the Scottish Government produced, which shows the rise in diabetes cases between 2001 and 2009 from around 100,000 cases to well over 200,000. In almost exactly the same period, laser eye operations for retinopathy fell by 43%. Amputations are down 40%. They did that by using data. Every hospital in Scotland and all 1,200 general practices brought together what they know about everyone with type 1 and type 2 diabetes and they used that information to make sure all the different bits of the health service were working together and intervening at the right time. 40% is a big drop. But if you're one patient with diabetes, that can be the difference between keeping part of your leg and losing it. Imagine that for a second. And then think about all the implications for your long-term health the psychological effects, for how well you can get around. And then think about the impact your mobility has on how much it costs you and the social care system to look after you. That's why this talk is called Stories Are Just Data With A Soul. It's a quote from a TED speaker called Brene Brown. Thank you, Brene. I deeply envy your 19 million views. Because these big chunks of information tell us stories about how we live, about poverty, about how the price of alcohol can affect our health, about cot deaths, junk food, drug use, immigration, and how we respond to those issues changes lives. So what I want you to take away is this thought. Data can be pretty good. You don't have to be happy about how supermarkets and search engines and social media platforms are using how, what they know about you. But non-commercial research into society can help us build a better society. And if you think about it, that reference to cottaging I made at the beginning, which you probably thought I just gratuitously threw in to get your attention, is actually an example of people using data. Those members of the 1990s Gay Society were acting on information learned by previous generations who had effectively been carrying out field research. They found that if you go into some toilets, you will do nothing more eventful than empty your bladder. If you go into one near a military installation, you might make a new friend. It was the car in the fountain that was gratuitous. But I will always be proud of that plaque. And I will keep looking for those stories because one of my jobs depends on them. I hope one day, for example, to be able to shed a whole lot more light on this headline from one of our local papers in 1972 about a property not far from here which was apparently being rented by some of our students. I was two years old at the time. I am given to understand that life was different in the 1970s. The stories that data can tell us won't always grab our attention in quite that way. And they won't change the world overnight because change happens slowly. And it tends to happen in one small corner of the world at a time. But these stories can help people leaving prison to find work and stay out of prison and build new lives. They can save someone's eyesight or their leg. Data can give children in the most deprived parts of the country chances in life they wouldn't otherwise get. So I look forward over the next few years to telling some different stories too, and to being involved in my own small way in something which can change the world. Thank you.